this morning we have a special guest minister, Reverend Terry Bahaki. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religious faith that carries no creed and welcomes all seekers. We live our principles on a daily basis. At UU Catskills, we affirm Black Lives Matter. We're a welcoming congregation for members of the LGBTQ community. We are a congregational affiliate of the Ulster Immigrant Defense Network, and we are active voices in the effort to address climate change. Our sanctuary is built on Lenny Nalapi ancestral land. Thank you all for joining us this morning here in the sanctuary and on Zoom. If you're new, welcome. We encourage you to visit our website at uucatskills.org. And should any newcomer in the sanctuary be feeling bold, you can stand up and introduce yourself. So after the service, don't run away. There are an abundance of opportunities afterwards. Those of you on Zoom can stay connected for chat rooms. Those of you in the sanctuary, there will be refreshments out front hosted by the Saugerties Lake Katrine Community Circle. At 12, Reverend Bob is leading the UU 101, at which you can learn more about Unitarian Universalism. Although it's a, a one hour session is oriented toward visitors and anyone considering membership in UU Catskills, all are welcome. If you're here in person, you just need to gather at the, um, in the back of the sanctuary at noon. And if you're attending on Zoom, just use the link for UU 101 that you received in last week's update. Um, our congregation is also inviting you to Harambe's second annual African American Cultural Festival on the Strand in Kingston from 12 to 6, where UU Catskills will be represented. And in a first step in our journey to adopting the eighth principle, we are embarking on a common read. It's called Mistakes and Miracles, Congregations on the Road to Multiculturalism. You can order it through the UUA bookstore. You can order it, you can get a Kindle, you can contact the, or the office. More details are in the weekly update. I also would like to remind you of an ongoing painless fundraiser, the selling of Adams and Mother Earth cards. You buy a card for $50 from oh, right there, or Jerry Lynn or me, although I need more. Um, use it at Mother Earth or Adams, and you, your cast skills, get, gets $5 back. Um, I think that's a 10% return on your investment. For other week, for other announcements, uh, you can read about them in the weekly update or in the newsletter. Special thanks this morning to Jenny O'Grady Giddy and Bruce Wildey and Kathy Atwell, who are our tech geniuses. So today we have a guest minister, the Reverend Terry Pahaki, minister of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Stamford, Connecticut. Reverend Terry earned her Master of Divinity from Drew Theological School and Hartford Seminary, and was ordained at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northern Westchester, her internship congregation in the fall of 2021. All right, we're gonna go, she will speak to you in a minute, but first we're gonna have a prelude. Uh, River, sung by, it's, it's written by Bill Staines and it's sung by our own Rob Becker. <clears throat> I'm off to the side here. They didn't let me stand up there. <laughs> okay. 
Um, Catherine said I could say something about the song that I'm going to sing. This is a, a song by uh, Bill Staines, and it's known, I think, by um, some of you. And uh, the chorus is um, eminently singable uh, by groups, large and small. So if you uh, are so moved, uh, you may sing it with me. Just remember that I'm leading. <laughs> um, I was born in the path of the winter wind, raised where the mountains are old. Their springtime waters come dancing down. I remember the tales they told. The whistling ways of my younger days too quickly have faded on by. But all of their memories linger on Like the light in the fading sky River, take me along in your sunshine Sing me a song ever moving and winding and free You roll an old river, you change an old river Let's you and me river run down to the sea. I've been to the city and back again. I've been moved by some things that I've learned. Met a lot of good people and I've called them. Felt the change when the seasons turn. I've heard all the songs the children sing, listen to love's melody. I felt my own music within me rise, like the wind in the autumn trees. River, take me along in your sunshine, sing me a song ever Change an old river, let's you and me river run down to the sea. I've got to turn a page. Here we go. Someday when the flowers are blooming still. Someday when the grass is still green, my rolling waters will round the bend and flow into an open sea. So here's to the rainbow that's followed me here. Here's to the friends that I know. And here's to the song that's within me now. I'll sing it wherever. sunshine sing me a song ever moving and winding and free you roll an old river you change an old river let's you and me river run down to the to be here with all of you this morning. What a gift here in this time set apart together as to gather as we are in our wholeness and in our brokenness, in our common search for truth and meaning and in our longing for a new way. This is sacred time. Time set apart from the busyness of life to see 
and to honor this gift of being alive, this gift of experiencing our bodies, the breathing in and breathing out, the terrain of our emotions, the existing in relationship with all that is. I offer you these words this morning, this invitation from the poem Summer Sabbath by Reverend Kathleen McTeague. Consider your life, who you love and why, how blessed you are to be here, resting under a shower of birdsong, or what strange bright luck it is to be the owner for a few years of this beating heart, these wondering eyes, the ears into which the kingfisher spills her small chuckle as she dips across the water. You might ponder these things, but you could also let the whole creaking apparatus of thought come to a halt. You might surrender and let the world spill in through the five gates. No sentries standing surly watch, no one left to resist or defend, the innermost courtyard stands empty then, a clear fountain singing at the center. Friends, this is sacred time. This is our summer Sabbath that we share. Let the world spill in through the gates of our senses that we might awaken. It is good to be together. I invite you to join me now as you are able to say our words of unison affirmation together and you may rise in body or in spirit. <laughs> may we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love to all living beings. May we know once again that we are not isolated but connected in wonder and joy to mystery and miracle in the universe, in this community, and in each other. And we mark this time with the lighting of our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. We will light this morning with words by Ellen Hamilton. In faith together, we light this small scrap of light symbol of grandfather son's enormous power whose energy burns so brightly in these days of deep summer catapulting the leaves and vines vegetables flowers and fruits to astonishing size lengths and heights spilling over the tops of cages walls and trellises delighting and nourishing all beings we bask in the warmth and heat of these days with lightened hearts and quickened senses in gratitude and in faith. And in the light of that sun, let us sing together our gathering hymn number 298, Wake Now My Senses.
Let me see. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Reverend Bob, and when I'm not serving as Reverend Terry's glamorous assistant, I am honored to serve this congregation, um, and I'm delighted. Thank you very much, Terry, for leading our uh, service this, uh, today, and I'm <clears throat> delighted to get to hear a sermon. We don't talk all the time as ministers, honestly. We like to hear it as well. The children's story, I have to confess, someone left this in my office and probably told me, and it might have been on a Sunday. Did anyone show me? It's, yeah, I guess you could get the credit or the blame, but um, I, I do mean to give it back, but it's a wonderful book. <laughs> Sharon Mehdi wrote the children's story, uh, uh, the story for all ages, and you'll hear it's very much for all ages um, this today. And it's a book, short book, which I recommend to you. I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, and the story is called The Great Silent Grandmother Gathering. Um, and I may like to have a little help. You don't have to be a grandmother, but it helps um, if you want to help with this story. So one day there were two grandmothers who hadn't met before who met in a park. And a couple, they were noticed by a few people and they sort of walked along and then they picked a nice spot in the park and they just stood there. I have two grandmothers or any anybody women are, to stand up and play these two grandmothers they just oh you don't have any speaking roles don't worry so two grand thank you oh perfect they just stood there but you two you're right next to each other perfect perfect oh, thank you they just stood there um and uh uh don't worry there'll be there'll be more later you're you're on off the hook don't worry don't worry and they just were there for 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 ages and then they went home and um, and uh, people, their family that was meeting after the next day that evening, they usually sat and watched the news, and the news was always terrible, isn't it? And they they after they had watched the news, they, they said, "What happened with those two ladies standing in the park? What are those two grandmothers doing standing in the park? That's so silly! What were they doing? Were they waiting for a bus in the middle of a park? Were they they didn't even weren't even talking?" And a little boy said, "Oh, I know what they're doing. I asked them." So what, what were they doing? The little boy of the family said, oh, they were saving the world. And the father laughed at this. He said, saving the world, standing in a park in the middle of nowhere, just standing there saving the world, a likely story. Well, the next day, or, uh, those two grandmothers met again and they stood in the park and they were joined by two other uh, uh, women, the gr grandmother and also the mother of that family joined. And then they said, what is this? What's happening? And the, and the food with the dinner was late that. And so the, the, the father was upset and said, what's happening with this? Why, what's going on with these women standing around in parks? What's, what's the deal with this? And the next day, there were seven give or take, grandmothers standing up. And now the whole town noticed. And this town, which uh, was known as Kingston or Woodstock or take your pick, they said, what are all these Grandmas, so you know, the the the, the there was a um, a uh, the the police came out because they said we have to do something about this. You know what are they doing? They're saving the world. They're just standing around. What do you mean saving the world? So the police came, and they said you can't stand like this. You can't have a protest without permission. He said, well, we're just standing here enjoying the park. That's not illegal, is it, officer? The police officer said, you know, they've got a point. No, yeah, no, it's not legal. It's fine. So the seven grandmothers gathered. The next day, it was ten grandmothers. And women and maybe one or two men as well. And people, this is getting out of hand, the town thought. And, you know, there was a journalist um, and he decided to make a name for himself. And he, he wrote a, an article saying how ridiculous it was that these women thought they would save the world, which didn't need saving anyway, did it? They saved the world by just standing in a park and so many people. It's just, it was just, it was just didn't make any sense. And he it was a very derisive, uh, negative article. And uh, people read it, and it, it actually spread on the internet. Oh, I don't know if you heard of the internet, but it spreads news really quickly. <laughs> and so the next day, which was Friday, not just in uh, Kingston and Woodstock and Saugerties, but in Istanbul and Djibouti and in Tokyo, there were uh, hundreds of thousands of grandmothers and a few others as well that stood up. And they stood at the park, they stood together in silence and in solidarity. And the newspapers noted all this, this strange occurrence of all these women standing up in the middle of the park. And they also noted on that particular day, there was no fighting anywhere in the world. 
Here's the story by Sharon Mead. Thank you, Sharon. It's a wonderful book. Thank you all for taking part in that. We now have a time, as is our tradition, just looking for the microphone, of joys and sorrows. So um, if you'd like to share something happening in your life or the life of someone you love, um, you are welcome to share our joys and sorrows and we place stones in our common bowl as um, as, as, as a stronger than we are that is ever changing and growing. Let us take these joys, these sorrows, these cares into our hearts in a time of life, sacred thread that binds us, abide with us today and help us to find a still point of rest in the midst of a world that is constantly changing, in the midst of upheaval and grief, may we find peace. We offer our gratitude for all of the joys shared today, for celebrations, birthdays and weddings, milestones, moments of beauty. And we stretch out our hearts to hold our cares, our concerns, our losses, our sorrows. We lift up those who are sick and dying, those who are grieving, those who are hurting, those who seek a place to bring the wholeness of their lives. And we name all that is sacred in prayer as we enter a time of guided meditation. So I invite you to just take a moment to notice your breath. Notice the inhale first and then the exhale. Know that breath is life. Breathe slowly, gently. And as you breathe, I invite you to create a picture in your mind, a picture of a place where you are at peace, a place of beauty, a place where you can lay down your worries. Perhaps a warm hearth or a quiet stream, an ocean or a garden. Take a moment to just picture this place. And in this place, Imagine the beings in your presence. Perhaps there is someone beside you, animals, birds. Take a moment to honor the beings that are with you in this place, including yourself. Take a moment to listen, listen to the sounds. Take in with all your senses, your surroundings, taste, smell, the feeling of touch. Simply be in your place. You are here. You are in a place of calm, a place of beauty, a place of rest. And this place where you are is always with you. It is a place 
that you can return to and you can carry with you even as you turn your attention back to the present, back to this space of community. Know that wherever you are, wherever you go, you carry your sacred place within. And even in times and spaces of conflict and tension, you can create a place of refuge wherever you go. In the spirit of breathing, we will breathe together with our voices. Our meditation song, number 1009, Meditation on Breathing. And Reverend Bob and Catherine and myself, we will be leading you in song. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to start with the breathing? Okay. Yeah, we all have no. three parts. Breathe <laughs> in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, Poem by Mary Oliver. When I am among the trees, especially the willows and the honey locust, equally the beech, the oaks, and the pines, they give off such hints of gladness, I would almost say that they save me in daily. I am so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me, the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches and they call again. It's simple, they say, and you too have come into the world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light and to shine.
The theologian and mystic Howard Thurman told a story from his days as a seminarian at Colgate Divinity School in my hometown of Rochester, New York. Thurman described walking down Main Street very late one night. The hour was so late that there was almost no traffic. And as he walked along, he became aware of what seemed to be the sound of quietly rushing water. Now Thurman realized that he had been hearing this soft rumbling for some time, but had only suddenly become aware of it. The next day he learned from one of his professors that for a certain distance at that time, this was in the early 1920s, under Main Street ran a part of the old Erie Canal. This was the sound that he had heard. It was a sound that had been there all along running beneath the busy street, but in the daytime with the sound of rushing traffic, he could not hear it. And so Thurman goes on to describe that this is the way with our lives. How many times has the busyness of our schedules, the noisiness of our anxieties and worries, the constant traffic of the news kept us from hearing the gentle, quiet stirring of our own inner rivers, our souls. For Thurman, that quiet rumbling was nothing less than the very presence of God within. And the practice of quieting ourselves, what he called centering down, was a pathway to connection with an inner sacred, or in his words, a deeper note, which only the stillness of the heart makes clear a seed of transforming love. I know I am not alone in relating to Thurman in that strain to hear the sound of the water amidst the chaos of life, the world that is constantly changing, in which we find ourselves often in just survival and reaction mode, the climate threats and disasters, gun violence, pandemic and disease, racism, the stripping away of human rights. Each of these demands an urgent response and our own lives full of their own brokenness and pain, worries and losses, aging and dying, continually letting go. These surround us. This too is a culture that we live in that assesses value based not on who we are, but on what we produce. That too is noise. The amount of money we make, the titles we hold, the number of Twitter followers that we have. Noise that repeats in our brains with the question, am I enough? Those voices of judgment, self-critique, disappointment roll on like traffic, drowning out the river, the river within, the river beneath. This past year, I personally experienced life upheaval with the inevitable ending of my marriage in my first year of ministry. And during the past 12 months, I have moved twice and I'm still, I'm coming to you today, still in the middle of unpacking from that second move. And amidst that change, I sometimes find myself simply joining that speeding traffic, risking to do that versus get run over. And finding that quiet river is challenging, to say the least. And yet it tugs, it tugs at my sleeve, the incessant whisper to slow down. Over the past few years, we've collectively, collectively experienced life-shattering change. COVID, the pandemic had the impact of a relentless excavator, unearthing realities long buried, and bringing us face to face with our own hardest truths, our most important values also. And in the middle of this year, we've survived personal and collective trauma. 
But looking at an even larger picture, we are always changing. It's the rapid wheel of motion that is life, the unfolding of seasons and years. Life changes, life is change, and so do we. And change can set us into a tailspin. It can lead us to unravel. Finding stillness and quiet amidst that tumult, it's a challenge. And we ask, where is the still point? The poet Mary Oliver offers us an invitation, but that invitation doesn't come from herself. It comes from the world around her, from the natural world. And I love and can relate to her honesty when she says in the poem, when I am among the trees, how distant she is from the hope of herself, the self that walks slowly and bows often. And yet, even from being so far away from our ideal, patient, monastic selves, the trees invite us back. The trees invite her back to another rhythm, another pace of life. The trees invite her to stay a while, to go easy, to be filled with light and to shine. Perhaps you've experienced this invitation too, invitation from the natural world, from the season of summer, time to be among what poet Wendell Berry calls the peace of wild things. For me, the month of July was, as a minister, vacation and study leave is very precious time. And I had the month of July to slow down, to reflect, to journal, to sit by water, to face big things within grief, the work of acceptance that comes with change. And I moved to a new place that is in the middle of the country where I am surrounded not by traffic, but by the sounds of birds and crickets and sheep in the morning, <laughs> sheep buying and very beautiful in New Paltz. So. Places of stillness, reminders to slow ourselves down are present though, even in the busiest and most chaotic of places. Several years ago, I worked at the Garrison Institute, a retreat center on the Hudson River directly across from West Point. And while working there at this beautiful, peaceful place, I often heard the sounds of emergency, the sounds coming from training at Camp Smith Army, Army Camp or Stewart Air Force Base uh, planes overhead or Indian Point sirens. Sounds of warning, training, emergency are often present. Even in that moment though, there was the face of the giant Buddha looking out peacefully upon the water and retreatants in quiet meditation wandering through trails and gardens. A paradox, a paradox that is our lives, urgency and stillness, always both continually present. Stillness that is often difficult to hear and yet so necessary if we are to face those emergencies, if we are to face those warnings, the need to slow down, to heal our relationship with time. Because too often fast reactivity leads to regret. And I know we've all experienced that email sent too quickly, those words we can't take back. And the rush, rush, rush to fix things on the surface without truly understanding the deep roots of, cha of systemic change that lie beneath. If we are to truly fix things, we have to look deeper. And slowing down means taking a look at those roots. In her book of fiction, The Signature of All Things, writer Elizabeth Gilbert follows the life of a scientist who studies moss. And I love the phrase she uses to describe the pace at which moss changes and evolves. She calls it moss time. <laughs> and I've thought about moving in moss time, moss time that is achingly slow compared to human time 
although fast if you think about rocks, <laughs> compare, compare moss to rocks. Slowing down is to move in moss time. And Gilbert was actually inspired by her, with, to write her book after reading another book, Gathering Moss, which was written by uh, indigenous botanist Robin Wall Kimmerer, who also wrote Braiding Sweetgrass. But Gathering Moss, I listened to it in July on my audiobook and read some of the passages. It's really written with the eye of a naturalist, a meticulous, attentive eye to detail. A naturalist who observes and studies 12,000 different species of moss. <laughs> Imagine, I mean, usually you see the moss and you, you walk right by it, but there are 12,000 different species. And <laughs> she weaves this lens with an indigenous way of knowing slowing down that also recognizes the human connection with the natural way of things with the natural way in which we are not separate but integrally connected to slow down is to come into our bodies into our senses into our connections with the world it's to notice mosses and other miracles abounding i'm a avid gardener, community gardener. And for me, that practice of just getting down on my hands and knees in the dirt, doing a little bit of weeding of kale beds or harvesting bucketfuls of cherry tomatoes, those are grounding practices. But it may be many different things. I, I talked about going slow a few weeks ago in a congregation in Westport and someone came up to me and said afterwards, I stack rocks on the beach. <laughs> that is my practice. So maybe you have your own way of slowing down. As a gardener, I notice when I'm in the dirt, relationships, relationships of an ecosystem by getting closer. I notice earthworms who loosen the dirt, pollinators, bees, and butterflies among the flowers and bites out of my tomatoes by thirsty squirrels <laughs> who are reacting to a drought and finding sustenance. Slowing down leads us to perceive the whole, how our relationships are tied together. It is a natural and also a radical way of being in the world. You heard of slow movements such as slow food. There's also a slow ministry movement calling us into a different way of being. And it is a reaction to a culture that really values speed and devalues slowness. Using telling somebody you are slow is usually not a compliment. <laughs> and yet, People who think with a slower processing speed are often those who possess high skills of attention and focus to detail. I know a few in my own life, people who can really think about the depths of a problem, forge solutions of higher complexity, artists who really notice things, writers, problem solvers, inventors, slow people are changing the world. Yeah, so yeah, devaluing slowness, that's an aspect of capitalist competitive culture. And reclaiming slowness is necessary, necessary not only for ourselves, but for changing the world, like those grandmothers. Slowness allows us to go deeper. Slowness allows us to, to heal, to process grief, and difficult feelings rather than just respond in anger. And it draws us into a place where we can connect with a quiet seed of transforming love. So while the problems around us require a response, real change requires intentionality. So slowness is about intentionality, requiring us to act with our deepest values, as we've considered what are our deepest values, slowness allows us to think about them and then react from that space, not just strike back with reaction. 
Writer and social justice activist Adrienne Marie Brown writes, there is such urgency in the multitude of crises we face, it can make it hard to remember that in fact, it is urgency thinking that got us to this point, urgent, constant, unsustainable growth. Our potential success lies in doing deep, slow, intentional work. It's about living, living compassion, justice, love, accessibility in alignment with the planet and the people on it. Asking the questions, how do we live our values? As we are, so our work will be. And so I invite us to consider slowing. Find our connection with the earth, our spiritual practices, but even more than that, with each other, with communities, communities of peace that we create, creating it for one another, places of rest, places to return to ourselves. Our UU communities can be those trees, those trees who whisper, stay a while, those trees that return us back to ourselves. Communities can be rivers calling, flowing quietly beneath, offering us a place to create sanctuary and just being together on a Sunday morning, that can be a countercultural radical response to urgency. So can committee meetings, believe it or not. <laughs> I tell my, my committees in Stanford, relationships above agendas. So we start with relationship first. It's hard. <laughs> it's a work of creating change in the middle of continual change. Friends, I offer you this invitation. Be the trees, be the grandmothers. Take the time, center, peace, create that shade for one another, create that invitation. Examine the roots of the problems we wish to solve. We need places and people of peace to survive and to heal. So let us offer one another this gift. Let us save one another in daily. May it be so. Our congregation is sustained by your generous gifts. Half plate donations for August will go to the Center for Creative Education and a nonprofit community center for arts, technology, wellness, and cultural education. You can donate online at uucatskills.org slash donate, or send a check to us to this address at 320 Sawkill Road in Kingston, or you can use the QR code for PayPal online or on your program. <clears throat> or you can put some money in the basket when it comes around. Our offertory is Blue Ridge by Malus and Artis, sung by our own Rob Becker. Your offering will now be gratefully received. I'm trying to be slow. <laughs> Working for me, I don't know about you. <laughs> this, is, um, this is a song that uh, I used to do with my trio uh, back maybe 10 years ago. And um, I think I'm still in tune. And um, it, um, it, it was too short when we got it. It only had one, one verse. So uh, uh, I wrote a second verse. I'm not a songwriter. I don't write songs. 
but I used to be an advertising copywriter. So for money, I write. So uh, <clears throat> that's what I did. So the second verse is mine. And uh, this is really a quite lovely song that was done originally by the seldom seen, uh, named because they are. Uh, but they're, they're a wonderful, they were a wonderful group, and I think they're still, still active. Um, but uh, this is, this is a, a very nice song. go forth from this place slowly. <laughs> Let us go forth with intention, with hope, with careful consideration and gentle zeal, with all of our attention attuned to the world and all of our senses open to receiving gifts. And may we in the receiving become more fully alive that we may bring forth through the giving of ourselves, more justice, more peace, more compassion to the world. May it be so. And we will extinguish this flame, extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, 
or the fire of commitment, these we carry in our hearts until we meet Yeah, I know.